Uh, so now Martin is going to talk to us about machine learning in production. When I uh, read the uh, summary for the um, presentation, let me read it to you. Uh, uh, just a background, I'm uh, an SRE um, as a trade, right? So production is kind of my thing. And I was read the presentation, the, the summary, and he said, uh, had you ever deployed a machine learning project to production with the same principles as a software project? I did, I failed. So I was like, yes, I get to see how this failed and the lessons learned. So thank you very much, Martin, and uh, it's with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Um, yes, that was like the first line. I think this is really the summary of this presentation. But I try not to dive too much into the whole ML operations, ML ops topic today, because I think there are really capable people around here, then, then, I, then I'm a little scared to talk about it. Um, but I want more to talk about my journey about numerous uh, machine learning projects and um, what I learned and what I think is really essential to make the machine learning project production ready in the industry. So for this, for this talk, I would say what is needed to successfully run machine learning in production is like the central question that you should be able to answer afterwards or at least get inspired to answer afterwards. And for me, that starts with the differentiation between what is machine learning in industry and what is machine learning in production, because I think there is a huge difference and this difference we have to clarify. Otherwise, we cannot talk about what is needed for academia and what is needed for industry. And further, I see like three very important areas to run a project successfully. And this is the data view, the model view, and especially also the runtime view, because these three components are crucial in order to make your machine learning journey successful or your customer's machine learning journey, so to speak. So, um, yeah, what is needed to make a machine learning project into production? You need data. That's the first thing we're going to talk about. You need a model. That's the second thing you're going to talk about. And then we need a runtime environment. That's also something we're going to quickly talk about. Um, I prepared Jupyter notebooks to illustrate a little of my views. And of course, you also need coffee time and resilience. And I think this is like one of the hardest part, not the coffee, but the resilience. Um, for me, the biggest difference between industry and academia is that in academia, we always tend to compete on a given data set. You, you can look into one of the oldest data sets in the world, I would say that's MNIST, this digit number recognition. Um, we have this, this is given, and then scientists compete on this data set in order to get better accuracy, more robustness into the models. And in the end, the only result that counts is your accuracy number in the end of the day. Um, short question, who has, who, who has tinkered around at home with TensorFlow Keras? Should raise the hand. Who knows uh, what supervised learning is? Okay, most of the people know what supervised learning is. Um, just in maybe two sentences to summarize it, supervised learning is a learning technique where you have a model. Let's say this is a black box. You have an input and you have an output and you train your model with a given input and a given output. So for example, if you input a, a picture, 30 times 30 pixels with a handwritten number, that's the MNIST data set. Then your output is like a vector with 10 entries. And if you input a picture that has um, the value three on it, then your output in the fourth position should be one and the rest of the vector is zero because the output is stochastic. So if a machine learning model predicts you um, 0 0.2 in the first entry and then 0 0.8 in the second entry, this means that with 20% chance the output is a zero and the input is a zero and with 80% chance the output is a one. Just to distinguish this um, shortly. And in academia, this is really important because you compete on a very fixed data set and this data set is like non-negotiable. Every publication you write is based on a data set and you try to improve pre-processing -pre of your data, you try to improve your model, but in the end you're always measured on performance and performance is, uh, is, is also the only variable that counts somehow because you try to beat your, like you try to beat the other university that already has 99.95%, but maybe you get 99.96. Um, in industry, I think the most important question is, what is good enough? Do we really need 100%? Because 100% doesn't exist. But is 99 enough? Is 95 enough? 
is 90 enough, but maybe also 85 is enough. And I think this is one of the first questions that we need to answer when bringing machine learning models to the industry. The second thing is this is also variable, like in academia, we need a model. But here, the beauty of it is your data set is variable. If you spend one day collecting data at a client or taking pictures of, um, of whatever um, you try to recognize, then you have a data set that's covering one day. If you do this for seven days, you already have a data set that's seven times as big and you have covered a whole week. If you do this for the whole year, you have 360 times more data and you're free to do this over 10 years. This is, this is the beauty of the industry. You just can, you can, you can set your own rules. You can put as much data into your training as you want and you can use as little data as you want. The only question is, will it fulfill your minimum viable criteria in order to make this a successful deployment in the end? So working on industry projects, I would say consider yourself lucky because the best answer is always get more data. This helps in most of the cases a lot. But also don't underestimate the effort you have to make in order to clean and label and verify the data because we tend to underestimate how, how difficult it is to build a good data set. I mean, many people failed and even the biggest data sets that are publicly available and are, that are used for competitive reasons are not perfect. There are at least 24 confirmed classification errors in the MNIST data set. And I just printed a bunch of them in order to, to just visualize what it is. The label indicates which number it should be according to the data set and the picture is actually the, data, the, the picture that I got out of the data set. And I think a few of them we can discuss, like for example, the first row, the rightmost picture. My handwriting is not so nice. My sister's handwriting is even worse and I would say she would recognize this as a nine. So this is, this, this is open to discussion. But there is even some more. I grabbed from six different data sets a bunch of images which are like, in my opinion, correctable, have, can be multi-label, are neither. Because, I mean, honestly, the, the given six there, I mean, th for me, this is not even a number. This could be an L with lots of creativity, but the L should not be in a data set with numbers, right? And then there is also a non-agreement. I mean, the number four over there is, is it a four or is it a nine? We don't know. Also, if you consider the, the CIFAR 100, I mean, the hamster and cup picture, is it now a hamster or is it a cup? I mean, it's kind of both, right? And this is really the problem um, also in industry. You, you have to be very specific about your data set and you, try to find, you have to try to find good samples. And finding good samples and labeling good samples is really a difficult, to uh, really a difficult task. Um, if, uh, two or three years ago, um, while I was working here at OST, I worked on an Swiss project where we did, um, we did um, a machine learning project to recognize packaged goods damages. That means like if, the, if it's well sealed out of production or not with a camera system. And therefore we recorded, I would say 100 to 120,000 pictures. And in order to build our ground truth, the data set that we use to train our models, we actually deployed on a tablet, an app that works similar like Tinder. You swipe left if the package is broken, you swipe right if the package is not broken. The mechanism is the same. Um, and we let people do this. People that are actually working on the production line verifying that the package is, is good or the package is bad. And when we talk about 100%, then we talk about no mistake ever. And the, the cruel truth is, on A to A relabeling, this means I see a picture and three weeks later I get to see the same picture. I am only 97 to 99% accurate. This means that in a, in a test, whether it's broken or it's not broken, there is one to three percent of pictures where I'm not sure. Because I mean, honestly, if I show you like, if I show you a car or a horse, 
it's very obvious what the car and what the horse is. But if the data is so close and the details are so, lit, uh, so small and so insignificant, I mean, for the product, it's a significant detail, but for our visual uh, understanding, it might be insignificant. We don't get 100%. And if we do the same test with people, where person A is classifying images and then person B is classifying the same images and we try to match them, then we end up at 95 to 98%. So what I learned there, and this is a very important lesson, try to focus on rare samples, samples that are very unexpected and don't occur frequently. This adds robustness and also focus on high, freak, uh, on high certainty samples. For me, high certainty samples are the samples that are obvious. If a package is broken, a package is broken, but not like details that it's like aesthetically not pleasing. I mean, try to define aesthetically not pleasing just like to, your, um, to, to the people who are working there, then it's even probably 10 or 100 times more difficult to explain a machine what aesthetically pleasing is. And then start early, train, predict, repeat, and verify this. Try to grow your data set, but try to start early with, with model building. This is what I learned. Because the implication of false labels, they are really, really bad. This is, um, this is actually um, a plot I, I took out of a paper where they tried deliberately to corrupt labels. Label corruption means they switched labels um, um, between classes. So in the data set, there was deliberately wrong information. For example, a car and a horse, then the labels got, got switched out and suddenly the, the horse was a car and the car was a horse. And what we see is that we have label corruption. And the more label corruption we have, the worse the model gets. But the problem is, if we sample in the, in, there in a factory, we sample data and we classify them, then we assume that this is 100% right. But our 100% right is not 100% right from the beginning. So actually, the performance that you're measuring might not be really the performance that you're seeing. Just keep this in mind. So my first statement, um, considering the data view is model is queen, data is king. But in order to prove, prove my point, I prepared a small um, Google Colab notebook, and I would like to walk with you through this, because, I mean, I talk now for the last 10 minutes about data, but let's prove it that it really is the more data, the better. Um, I took the um, German traffic sign database. I scraped all the, all the traffic signs. They are 30 times 30 pixel with just traffic signs, like for example, speed 70, speed 50, but also um, watch out pedestrians, um, stop signs, stuff like that stuff. You should see normal traffic every day if you have a driver's license or you cycle. Um, yeah, the not so important part is actually we start with um, mounting the drive and doing some imports. Then we just need to verify that Google has some GPU resources for me, then some visualization that we need later. Um, then here is actually the script that I use to load data, but we don't do this because I did. I pickled all the files into a, into a big pickle in order to make this possible, otherwise the throughput on Google Cloud is really bad. Um, so what we do here is actually we, we load the data and we load the labels that we need for training. We verify that everything is loaded. And what we do here is actually we split the data to a so-called training and validation set. The training set is used to actually learn and the validation set is actually used to validate. This is like an exam. If, if you were a kid at school, then first you learned your math stuff and then suddenly you had to write an exam with stuff you haven't ever seen before. And this is exactly the same here. Um, for the sake of it, I'm starting with a test set size of 80%. This means the training set gets super small and the test set is really big. And then I have to do some syntactic things like do categorical in order to get like a nice categorical vector. This is loaded. I took a very simple um, vanilla network. I didn't put too much effort into it into like improving the performance whatsoever because to prove my point, I think this is enough. The network has 242,000 parameters. It's also a size where I can really train it on a Google Call app without like having to send you for, for lunch break and see you around Christmas. Um, and then we start the training. Wait, I just have to verify something, otherwise... Yeah, that's, that's... Important here is also um, 
the example is not perfect. I'm well aware of that because if the data set is smaller, the convergence rate is slower. So it's not completely perfect, but therefore we increase the epoch size. The epoch size means just that the training takes a little longer um, in order to compensate for that. I mean, how to zoom in here? Hmm. Is it better? better okay good 25 epochs are over then we plot our we plot our graphs yes you see here actually that the model got better and better and better um and also there is no wonder with this imbalance in the in the data set that the validation set because it's so big that actually the performance is better compared to the training this doesn't happen too often but sometimes this happens if the balance is it's, it's off balance and what we are doing now is we are um loading a data set we've never seen before this is the data set that is used by was used by this competition in order to verify how good the models are because keep in mind if somebody is giving you the answers for your exam you will probably learn the answers too and in order to avoid this, we do it that way. And what we get here is we get an accuracy of 93% and an AOC score of 99, which is pretty amazing. It's a very confident and it was in 93% of the cases, the classification was correct. But what's going to happen if we, if we work now a little longer or a little harder and spend some significant amount of time getting more samples then we in this case i decreased the the training size i increased the training size decreased the test size here it's now thirty-five thousand samples instead of approximately 3700 that we had before and we, i have to here reduce this otherwise this takes too long and i don't want to bother you with that this takes 10 epochs We have actually a good day on Google today because it's working pretty well. Okay, then we do this. Yeah, first of all, what we see, what we should see is actually that the convergence rate is quicker. Here it's a little exaggerated. Um, also, the, the, the training results and the validation results are higher, which is also an indicator we have more data. The network can learn more. But the most important thing is actually if you write the test now, 96, 99, it's better. And I mean, we see it also here, it's 99.91, and before it was 99.6. So also the, the certainty of the prediction got better. Certainty of the prediction means in the output vector, the, the numbers are closer to zero or to one, and there are not too many numbers around 0 0.5 because 0 0.5 means the network doesn't know whether it's a stop sign or it's a, it's a speed sign. But 1 or 0 means it's very deterministic about it. And the closer we get there to 1, the better the performance is actually. Okay. So what I proved to you, if you have the ability and you have the freedom, then please invest time in improving your data set. This is where it can really make big progress. Now let's talk about the model view, um, because often, and especially in academia, you, you, you compete on an accuracy. You, you want to get this 99.6 in order to beat another university at 99.5. Um, but in industry, this is not, not often needed or not always needed. And also keep in mind, there are constraints that you have when you choose your model. One, one thing that sometimes we tend to forget is that training costs. Um, whether you're a startup or you're a big company, it has implications. For example, GPT-3, this is one of the language understanding models. It needs approximately 100,000 US dollars to retrain. I remember when I was um, um, writing my master thesis and then I read a paper by, by Sony, A, um, Sony, Sony AI Labs about a network they trained in less than one hour. I was like, wow, we made it, we got there. Then when I started reading the paper, they used actually the whole, um, the whole cluster they used to render movies to train this network. And suddenly it was like, yeah, okay, I cannot do this at home, so it's not a progress for me. Um, 
Then the next thing is consider robustness. Robustness is sometimes really more important in the industry, and especially in medical and healthcare applications. This is this is this is really difficult. Um, I I can. Bring an example. I, I worked in um, medical image classification um, on a project, and we got a nice training set of um, MRI data to in order to find a special organ in there. And the, it was a, it was a three three Tesla Siemens scanner, and we got pretty decent results. But then somebody asked, "Yeah, can I also use the data that we got from the 1.5 Tesla Philips scanner?" and the answer was, yeah, why not? Let's try it. The performance was terrible, because the the whole pic, the whole uh, picture generation out of the 1.5 Tesla scanner was 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 completely different. I mean, a radiologist saw it. For him, it was not a not a difference between whether it's a Siemens or or a GE or a Philips scanner. But for our neural network, it was like the performance dropped to like 69 percent or something. And before we were at 97, 98. Yeah, then also confidence is an important factor. How confident are you with classification? This is the AOC value that I showed you. This is also something to consider. But I think there are also other val other values that you should keep in mind and track them. Um, model complexity also over time, we have a trend that nowadays people want to do more deep learning. They want to do less of traditional algorithms. And they say that, that um, traditional algorithms are not performing that well anymore. Um, I believe that especially if you have less data and you need to explain things, go with a traditional algorithm. It has more robustness. It's better and easier to explain. If we go with a deep learning, often data is the key. You need lots of data. And if you think you have lots of data, then you need 100 times more. Um, the parameter space is just huge. It takes, a lot, it takes a lot of computing power, but you can also do state-of-the-art things like image segmentation, um, deep dreaming, you can solve problems in the area of um, autonomous driving. It's really cool, but it's not always needed. And especially in the industry, sometimes startup t uh, startups come and tell us, yeah, you know, we need deep learning. And then, yeah, wait, let's explain the problem first, and then maybe we can decide whether we need deep learning or not. Um, yeah. In my opinion, um, accuracy is a compliance problem, because in the end, you have to understand what it means to, to classify something wrong or an industry use case. Um, then the loss function and the things that you optimize are often are always driven by a business goal. What is the cost of sending somebody home who might have cancer but was not detected? And what is the cost of that I get again an email that the Prince of India or the Prince of uh, Nigeria is trying to send me $5 million? I mean, this is really something we have to distinguish. Um, yeah, then of course you have unequal costs of misclassification. This comes automatically with the with the loss function. But then also a very important thing is model explainability. Sometimes being able to explain what your model does is worth at least the same as knowing how good it is. And in general, state of the art is probably not needed. You can do with vanilla networks and with small networks, especially in computer vision image classification. Stuff that's maybe two, three, four, five years old, you can do good enough jobs if your data set is right. Um, yes, I have a short demo here, but I know that we are a little tight on schedule, so um, we just go briefly through it. I have the, I brought a data set that's used, um, did I? Oh, no, Google, please. It's the um, income threat. Okay, um, this data set actually contains um, or data about people and whether they have more or less than 50,000 um, US dollar annual income. And the goal is actually to predict whether they are above 50,000 US dollar or not. It's a zero and one very binary classification problem. And the data set consists age, work, class, also if they work for private in private industry or um, in public government, their education, then the years of education, married status, um, occupation, relationship, race, um, gender, then capital gain, whether they have like savings or not, um, or they made savings in the last year, or they lost money last year because they, they are in debt. 
and how many hours per week they work and their yeah where they come from. Okay, yeah, we have here a few classes that we are going to dive into. Um, I want to spare you the the or the boring things here. Um, I just load everything and I make it nice for a machine learning model to to train. And we go with the neural network because we heard that actually deep learning is really really cool and. And it should also work on Google Colab. Yeah, it works perfect. Yeah, we're almost done. We train the network, and then we verify our results. Yeah, and the, and the score is we got a, on the training set 85% and on the test set 84%. It's pretty decent. It's pretty nice. But now, if we think about the business case, that actually this classification problem was maybe asked by, by a governmental organization, and they want to know what to change and where to invest money in order to improve people's situations, then maybe something else might be a better option. For example, like a good old fashioned decision tree. A decision tree is like a self-learned if statement. And we get 83% on training accuracy and 83% on testing accuracy. Yes, we are 2% lower, but what we can do now is we can answer the question where to invest money in order to bring people from below 50k to above 50k a year. And yeah, apparently if you have half a relationship, that's an important driver. No, um, I'm just kidding. The, this is um, um, encoded because you cannot learn enums, so we encode them to actually integer values and below 0 0.5 just means below 1, so if you're single, and then you can distinguish whether you're in the class of 50k above or 50k below. Yeah, that's just my take on model explainability. Um, yeah, I'm a little tight on schedule, but that should actually work. The last part, actually, I would like to talk about is to know your platform, because your target runtime platform is really important in order to make a successful deployment. Are you running on Google Cloud? Are you running on a Raspberry Pi? Do you need high throughput or do you need low latency? And high throughput and low latency are two completely different topics. Because if it takes five seconds to infer a deep dream and you get a thousand requests, then you scale out on a thousand machines and you still get this handled somehow. But if you are constrained by, let's say, the reaction time of average car driver is 0 0.3 seconds. If you're constrained by 0 0.3 seconds, then it doesn't matter how you scale out. The answer has to be here below the time of 0 0.3 seconds. Inference cannot take longer. Um, also, other questions that you have to answer sometimes is how much power does an inference step consume? IoT devices that are edge deployed, if you are tight on energy budget, then big acceleration cards and GPUs, they just eat up your battery life. This is a problem. And really, this might sound silly, but AI won't solve the problem if the battery is empty. Just think about it. And to conclude this, I have another example. I have no notebook because I know that I'm going to run out of time, but I can show you something. Um, two years ago, I got approached by a startup and they asked us to build for them for ice hockey an automatic detection engine. They would like to actually um, get statistical data from matches from their home team. So if the if the player moves from the from the defense into the offense, then we had to like uh, collect these events and then calculate um, which team had more offense time, which team had more defense time. When we looked into that, then I already had this knowledge that vanilla works well and free trained models work well. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I looked up on the internet. Oh, okay, YOLO v4 was the state of the art object detection model that was able to do it in one stage. Previously, you had to do multiple models to solve different problems, but this one was the first one who could do everything at once. And I read on, on a blog post that actually on, on RVS, you can do 65 frames per second. Yeah, I didn't read the small print. We got on first deployment 2.95 frames per second. Um, yeah, a few iterations later, we brought it up to um, 24 frames per second in order to make real-time video. But my take from here is 
consider where you're deploying it in the beginning and not in the end of your journey. Because for us, this was a problem. We realized that the devices that they used, um, like notebooks without dedicated accelerators, were just not powerful enough to, to handle the problem. If we had this knowledge before, we could have adjusted. We had to adjust anyway, so we learned something out of it on the, on the same time. So to summarize my talk, because I think I have like one minute left, um, the model in the industry is not the challenge, mostly. You don't need state of the art, mostly. But what is important, try to gather continuously high quality data, do frequent verification of your data and your model quality, understand also what is minimal acceptance criteria, like what is needed in order to fulfill the task, and consider your target platform before you start. RBS Google is fine, but maybe it runs on IoT. And as a last slide, uh, I worked here at OST, and one of my COVID projects was actually I built up um, a post-diploma study, 12 ECTS points for software engineers who are interested in machine learning. And if you're interested, then check out www.ost.ch slash CAS ML4SA, Machine Learning for Software Engineers. Um, we will start again in spring 2023. And maybe this is an opportunity for you to dive a little more into this topic. It takes a year. It's quite a diverse program. We have a mixture of academic people, but also industry people. We work together with, uh, with Sony Labs, who's providing also people to teach. Yeah, it's, I think it's a cool thing if, you, if you're curious about it. So um, that's it. Thank you for your attention. And do you have any questions? Yes. How do you go about missing data? How do you go about missing data? Do you ignore it, infer it? Can you um, can you maybe explain what you mean by missing data? Sure. So if you have a data set with some uh, observations which are missing, or you have nulls. Oh uh, yeah, that's always a very that's always a very tough um, challenge. Um, it depends if the data set is big enough. Just toss it away. It doesn't matter. But if, if the data, by nature of the data, it is possible to have null values, then it, it's complicated. And I think there is not one recipe that just solves it all, because it also depends on the nature of the model. Um, but if possible, try to avoid it. If it's not possible to avoid, then try to train it, but try to train it deliberately. I mean, especially in NLP, you can mask stuff that you explain the model that this is, might be missing and try to adapt to the procedure like this. Thank you, Martin, again.